So, nochmal ein herzliches Willkommen zu unserem äh, Phishing-Webinar, zu dem Phishing-Report 2021 der Firma Avanan. Äh, dazu möchte ich Sie recht herzlich äh, willkommen heißen. Äh, und äh, äh, Don, can you go one slide ahead? Ähm, äh, mein Name ist Richard Hellmeier, ich bin der Geschäftsführer der Firma Aquayo und äh, übernehme hiermit die Begrüßung. Wir sind äh, der Distributor der Firma Avanan in Deutschland, Österreich und der Schweiz. Den Vortrag äh, wird äh, Don Bryan halten. Don Bryan ist der CRO von Avanan und der wird uns äh, diesen Report vorstellen. Ähm, und äh, das Ganze wird in Englisch stattfinden. Falls Sie Fragen haben, dann äh, bitte ich Sie, die einfach in den Chat zu stellen und wir werden die im Anschluss an die Präsentation äh, beantworten. Vielen herzlichen Dank. So, Don, can you please start? You bet, Richard. Thank you very much for the, uh, the intro. Um, appreciate it. Yeah, again, my name is Don Byrne. I'm the CRO uh, with Avanon. Been here now uh, almost six years uh, since, you know, before customer won. And so got a lot of experience in the space and specifically with Avanon and excited to share with you the results of our uh, 2021 global fish report. Um, just a little bit of a preface before we get underway. One of the things that we always talk about when, when we're um, explaining who we are as a company and the results that we provide is where we sit in the architecture, where we're, where we're detecting attacks is behind your other layers of security, right? So this is this is where we sit. This is where your secure email gateway sits. This is where 0365 ATP or EOP sits. We sit here. Now I explain what this, because it's important to understand that all the data that we report is on what other vendors, what other security providers, what other layers have missed. So we're not talking about the totality of the problem out here. We're talking about the more advanced threats, the threats that that bypass your secure email gateways, that bypass Microsoft. We're talking about those more advanced threats. So I always like to start the conversation off just to make sure that, that you all understand that our focus is really on the more advanced threats. Um, to, you know, let's talk about the landscape, you know, real quick. We all know that phishing is a problem. Uh, there are all sorts of periodicals and, and uh, reports and articles that talk about the magnitude of the problem. But at the end of the day, phishing is the number one threat resulting in breaches. Uh, you can look at the Verizon data breach report uh, here in the United States, there's an FBI uh, crime report on, on cyber crime, uh, equates to about $1.8 billion in, in losses um, and, you know, 74% of the organizations in the US have experienced some sort of phishing attack. I assume in, in Germany and elsewhere, it's relatively uh, similar. Um, the key takeaways from the report, uh, let's start with what the key takeaways are. Every year we do a report, uh, what we call the global phishing report. And we, we do an analysis on all the data that we found. And this year, um, I, I wanna, you know, we got a few different takeaways than we had last year. So the very first takeaway that we had from our report this year on, on the, the, the phishing problem is advanced AI, artificial intelligence, machine-based learning is critical in stopping the advanced threats. Any solution you put in place today to solve that problem needs to not only, you know, they need to talk about AI, but they need to go much beyond that. They need to actually be built on AI and machine learning. So that's important. Uh, so AI is critical in stopping that advanced threats. The second key takeaway is that hackers are targeting the lowest, the lower hanging fruit, right? They're, they're, they're not necessarily looking for the crown jewel, right? They're looking for the organizations that may, may not be aware they need to have security in place. They may not be aware that they need um, phishing training. They're going after the lowest hanging through fruit. And uh, along those lines, you see the top three industries that have received the most phishing emails, nonprofit, retail, and government. 
So um, again, along the lines of being the lowest hanging fruit, um, the implications at the enterprise level, all this fishing problems, what does it mean to the organization? And what it means at the enterprise level, that SOC, the SOC organization, your SOC team, so if you have a large enterprise that you have a, you have a secure operations center, they're spending 23% of their time managing the email threat. That's a really important point to understand is it's not just costing us time or not just costing us money, it's costing us a lot of time. Uh, and the, the last point here, the last key takeaway is the junk folder. Um, the junk folder is not a safe haven. Um, junk folder is a breeding ground for phishing emails. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, I already kind of talked about the problem uh, with, with phishing, but we know that if you're a 10,000 user organization, uh, you get about 10, you get about 4,700 phishing attacks delivered to your end users every month. Um, it costs, that same organization costs about $3.7 million um, cost associated with phishing. And again, it takes about 23% of the SOX team time to manage that threat. And the report, what we found, what we did is we looked at a period of time. So we looked November 1st through February 25th. Uh, we analyzed almost a billion emails. Um, and, and actually of those billion emails, 3.5 million phishing attacks um, that, we, that we analyzed. And the first thing I'd like to talk about is how it breaks down by industry. And I touched on this uh, earlier on. How does it break down by industry? Well, the lower hanging fruit, right? Top targets, nonprofit, 3.6 times more likely than the average organization to receive a phishing email. That, that goes against our, 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 you know, what we commonly believe that financial and healthcare are the most targeted. They, at one point, yes, they absolutely were, right? But what is healthcare and finance done, right? They've implemented a lot of regulations here in the United States. They have HIPAA, uh, Security and Exchange Commission, implements controls and requirements. So there's a lot of compliance that's driving more controls into these verticals. What do hackers do? Well, they don't, you know, they don't want to go after the tough target. They want to go after the soft target, right? And here's, you know, evidence of that. Um, so the attackers have changed their targets to industries that have users more susceptible to phishing attacks. Uh, and, and, and again, these industries, you know, people don't, people think of nonprofit like, oh, nonprofit or, or, or church or a charity or whatever. They, not, may, they may not be, they don't need, you know, IT security. They don't need these enterprise security tools. They don't need to train end users on phishing. Well, it turns out they actually do. Uh, and this is proof uh, exactly to that. And then we look at, you know, okay, so we looked at by vertical, let's look at it by size type. And when we classify by size, we look at SMB, any organization that's small, medium business, 500 users and below. And we look at enterprise, obviously anything above that. So 501 users and above, that's what we consider enterprise. And what it turns out that if you're an SMB organization, you're 500 users or below, you're again, more likely to receive a phishing attack than if you're enterprise. Again, pointing to this idea that hackers are going after low-hanging fruit. Um, now, within an organization, you're within one of these organizations. Uh, you're, you know, maybe you're an executive. Maybe you work in the finance department or sales and marketing. How likely are you to be targeted based on the actual department that you're in? So, executives are more likely to be targeted. Right, and you can see over there, away on the on the left, um, that may not be a surprise. Um, finance and accounting may not be much of a surprise because think of finance and accounting; they're the ones that are controlling the books, they're the ones paying the invoices. And then you got sales and marketing over there. Sales and marketing, right? You know, a lot of uh, a lot of people in sales and marketing, um, they may be considered low hanging fruit in, in that they're not maybe they're not that technically sophisticated. They may not feel like they're a, you know, they're a target, uh, but it turns out in some degree they actually are. Uh, and if you look at the, the breakdown of attacks over there on the right, that confirms that point, that if you're in sales and marketing, you are more likely to receive a phishing attack uh, than any other department uh, in, in the organization. So again, confirming this idea of low hanging fruit, let me break into the sales and marketing team because, you know, 
They're not technical savvy. They may not think they're a target. We're going to go after their, them. We're going to get their, their credentials. Um, and the idea there is to work their way up the chain um, from there. Um, business email compromise. A lot of people talking about business email compromise. And, and you know, let's break down first what it essentially is. It's a hacker, right? Someone pretending to be someone there or a company that they are not. Um, so you might, you know, it might be someone pretending to be your CFO or someone pretending to be your CEO, right? It could be someone pretending to be your executive assistant, right? It could be someone pretending to be Amazon. Turns out that these sort of emails account for almost 21% of all email-based attacks. Now, these emails may not contain anything malicious in them. It might just say, hey, look, I need you to go and buy a bunch of gift cards. This requires AI to effectively catch. Um, and let's talk about, you, you kind of break down the impersonation. So business email compromise, you're gonna break it down into two buckets. One is user and one is brand impersonation. So user impersonation, you know, again, leveraging um, a trusted name, someone you know, right? Someone in your organization, like a coworker or an executive. Almost 30%, 29.4% of all impersonation emails attempt to impersonate an executive. And what we're also finding, what we also know for a fact, is not only are these emails prevalent, right? Someone pretending to be the CEO, but what happens is when you add a new employee to your organization, your employee, that new employee is more likely to receive an impersonation from an executive than the older employees. Why is that? Because they're new to the organization. Again, low hanging fruit. And those emails will come in the form of, hey, I need you to call me right away. Uh, it's important. I got to talk to you about a client or I need to talk to you about, you know, this, that or the other. Send me your cell phone number. Um, you know, again, we see these things all the time. 51.9%, almost 52% of all impersonation emails uh, attempt to impersonate someone else within the organization. So maybe not just an executive, maybe, uh, a, you know, a, an admin, um, maybe someone in HR, um, maybe someone that works for you, right? Uh, and 18.6% of all impersonation emails in attempt to impersonate someone else outside the organization, right? So someone that maybe a vendor that you work with, right? It, it, it maybe a name you recognize their account was compromised and they're now sending you, so they're impersonating those individuals. Non-executives are targeted 77% more often, security admins, that kind of thing. Uh, in terms of brand impersonation, remember I said break it down into user impersonation and brand impersonation. Brand impersonation is pretending to be Microsoft or IRS or Amazon. Hey, um, I need you to contact uh, the IRS right away uh, about uh, a, uh, your, your, your delinquent taxes. For those of you who aren't aware, IRS is the uh, taxation body here within the United States, it's a government organization. We all know Amazon. Um, hey, hey your, uh, your, your, your delivery um, is delayed. Um, if you want to change your order, click here. So again, these are brand impersonation uh, type of attacks. You know, let's look at it. Let's look at an impersonation, an actual impersonation attack. And along those lines, here you go. Package is delayed. Right, this, this might be what it looked like to the end user. It might look like, hey, you know, uh, it comes from a, what appears to be a legitimate email address, shipment-tracking at amazon.com. Hey, amazon.com, I trust that, right? But when you look at the details, right, you see a bunch of other weird stuff. You see an email address like this, it says it's coming from here, but it's actually coming from here. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other weird stuff going on in the headers. Uh, surprisingly, it takes, uh, uh, you know, sophisticated tool to really do an effective job uh, at stopping uh, these type of, uh, of attacks. Let's move on to the credential harvest piece. Uh, credential harvest, for those of you who, who aren't aware what, what it is, you move to 0365, your, um, your crown jewels are now sitting in a cloud environment somewhere. Uh, obviously, you in OneDrive and SharePoint, your email messages, so the hacker doesn't necessarily want to infect your computer. What does the hacker want to do? They want to get access to all your data stores. They want to get access to all your emails, your OneDrive. They actually want to get access to your legitimate email address. So what do they do? They send you a link, an email, 
looks like a good email. Looks like an email coming from Microsoft that says, hey, look, need you. Uh, here's a file. We want you to review. Let me know if you're good with it. You click on it. You log in. You've now your credentials have now been harvested. Um, so they can harvest anything from an email password to credit card numbers. Um, your credit card company, you get an email from your credit card company saying, hey, look, uh, log in here um, because, uh, um, you know, your your credit card needs to be updated. It's uh, it's it's expired. Uh, enter the new stuff here. And, and the, the, now your credit card has been, been harvested. They don't, um, you know, they'll it, you'll see two ways in which hackers use this. The one way is if they harvest your 0365 credentials, they might use your credentials and they might launch attacks from your account to other individuals within your organization or your partners or even worse, your customers, right? They might send an email pretending to be you from that account to your customers. Um, obviously not a good thing. Um, the other thing they might do is they might take, you know, once they got 100,000 um, email, you know, credentials, email address and password, they might put that out on the dark web. Right, it's a business. It's right, much like how they refinance mortgages. You refinance your mortgage, they get the mortgage, they sell it off to someone else. That's exactly what the hackers are doing here. They've they've built a business model around it. Credential harvests make up 54% of the attacks, and, and we see this over and over again across all the back the, the the vectors. And here's a perfect example. Beautiful looking message. Looks you know looks great you know to the the untrained eye. Um, you can see here, it's got your name here and it's got uh, even, you, you know, the date, it, it's got, you know, when it expires. And then you click on it, it takes you to a page you recognize. Um, looks exactly the way you want. The problem is when you enter in all that stuff, um, it, it's going to a hacker who takes that, that information. Um, extortion emails. Let's move on to extortion emails. You probably have heard the horror stories. Hey, look, um, you, you know, a user in your organization receives an email. Uh, I, I own your email account. I own your computer. I know everything about you. And to prove it, here's a password that you've used uh, in the past. So now what I want you to do is I want you to take this, this Bitcoin wallet address and I want you to send me a thousand bucks, right? And all this will go away if you just pay me the money. This was a lot more popular last year. I think people get caught onto it pretty quickly, but it still accounts for 2.2% of all attacks. And they're making a lot of money off of this, right? And, and um, these are the kinds of things that, that hackers will, will do. They'll say, I got control of your, your, uh, your video camera. And boy, if, if everyone knew the kind of things you were doing, um, it wouldn't be good. So. Um, you know, they're leveraging the scare tactic to try to get you to just pay off, uh, you know, write the check or in this case, a Bitcoin uh, payment of $1,000. Um, extortion, um, although it accounts for 2.2% of the attacks, what we do know is that if you've received um, an extortion email, um, that accounts for 38% of all the phishing emails that you will have. Um, so extortion is targeted, right? And, and they have intimate knowledge of the victim and they're gonna use that intimate knowledge um, very specifically. So that accounts for 38% of all the phishing attacks um, they've received. Um, you know, it's, it's effective. 76,000 victims have paid 70 million. So it's a lot of money going into, uh, into someone's pocket there. And uh, according to the FBI report I, I, I mentioned earlier on, it's the third highest reported by victim count um, form of, uh, uh, of, of cyber crime. Cool. Um, sender reputation. I want to explain what this really is. Sender reputation is, is an important element in, in determining whether an email is phishing or not. Um, sender reputation is, hey, you know, I'm getting an email from someone the first question I ask is, have I ever exchanged an email with this individual? Um, have I exchanged an email with anyone in this organization? Have any of my colleagues exchanged an email with this individual or anyone in that organization, right? And as you build up reputation, you know, hey, I trust this guy and I know how this individual talks uh, and I know, you know, the business that we're doing together. So when he emails me, it's, you know, 
it's relevant. Well, all that information is important in determining whether an email is phishing. And that's part of what goes into AI. And it turns out 84.3% of all phishing emails don't have a significant history, um, historical reputation with the victim. It means we maybe have never seen the, 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 the individual emailing me before. We've never, um, maybe, you know, I've only emailed them once. Right. And maybe it was about, you know, maybe I was uh, emailing him about an invoice. And next thing you know, he's he's emailing something about, uh, um, you know, a, a, uh, an advertisement that I'm put up like totally irrelevant. Right. So these things are all coming together in, 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 in understanding what is our reputation with an individual sender. Forty three percent of all phishing emails come from a domains with very low traffic. So if I create a domain today. And um, I start sending emails out from it. My domain is going to have a very low reputation. It's going to have very low traffic because no one's ever seen it before. There's not a lot of traffic coming from it. Um, but if I were able, you know, somehow compromise Amazon.com, send emails out from that, then that's considered very high traffic. Excuse me. Um, so what Avidon does, what we do is we we you know we use sender reputation as a way to determine whether, you know, A, do we have reputation? We look at years back in time. We know, for example, who you've communicated with and how often, and what have you, what have you exchanged? What kind, of, what kind of business information are you exchanging? We're developing that reputation. So then we can use that reputation to determine is this, you know, is this email legitimate or not? Um, junk email analysis, I talked about this earlier on, is a breeding ground. The junk folder is a breeding ground um, for phishing attacks. Don't go in your junk folder, right? The problem here is that junk folders are accessible to the end user. So people say, well, what do we do with these phishing? Just throw them into the junk folder. Well, that's the problem because users go into the junk folder. They have access to those emails. And a lot, of, a lot of compromises occur from users going into the junk folder, opening up emails that look legit, clicking on links. Next thing you know, they're compromised. 4.1%, um, when you look at just Microsoft, so we diagnosed Microsoft and Google. When you're looking at Microsoft, 4.1% of all emails uh, in the junk folder are phishing. 4.1%. Right, so four out of a hundred emails are actually malicious, right? And sixty-three point five percent of phishing emails are in the junk folder. So again, the point here is that Microsoft doesn't always know what to do with an email. It looks suspicious. We don't want to block it, but we want to put it in the junk folder. Um, again, it's littered with with with. Uh, um, with phishing attacks, and it's just, it's not a, it's not a good alternative. Google, just as bad, a little bit better, but, you know, 2.2% uh, of all emails in the Google workspace uh, junk folder are phishing, where 67% of all phishing emails are in the junk folder. So, again, we got to get off this idea of, oh, just put it in the junk folder, it'll be fine. If we don't know what to do with it, put it, and this is what a lot of folks that use Microsoft ATP or what they could now call Defender, that's one of the problems with ATP is that, you know, everything just ends up in the junk folder. And, and it, it, you know, it's, it, it becomes a breeding ground um, for phishing attacks. We get a lot of questions about links. Well, you know, you got an email here and we want to know if that, malicious, that link is malicious, right? You got a link scan. Link scanning is a way to go. Well, there's a problem here is because what hackers do is they obfuscate the link. What they do is they put strange characters in the link to prevent that link from being recognized by Microsoft or by your email gateway. Like you got Proofpoint and Mimecast and Barracuda. The hackers are doing things to make those solutions blind to the links, right? And what we found is that, you know, in 50%, you know, 51%, um, non-standard characters, uh, non-standard characters are in 51% of phishing links. So what, what does that mean? If I put like a, a strange character into a link, right? And, and I'm able to trick Microsoft in, in thinking that's not really a link. 
Now we got that noun standard character in there. There is a high degree of certainty that that link is malicious, right? So these non-standard characters use encoding to bypass a traditional uh, link scanner. And um, you know, with Avanon, what we do is we look at that link. We look and say, hey, is there a non-standard character in there? And then we correlate that with what else are we seeing about that email? Well, we're seeing that you not only you got a non-standard character in there, um, but you've also got um, fishy language. You've also got you know, a low uh, reputation score. You've also got, um, you know, uh, uh, links to low reputation domains. We calculate all this together. So when coupled with, you know, AI, link scanning uh, is, is, is effective, but link scanning alone is not going to cut it. So the importance of AI, what, what, you know, this is something we really need to get our heads wrapped around, uh, uh, you know, the way to really help combat the problem um, is not to implement more rules and more policies and you know better link scanning and to block this and block that. The real solution is AI, artificial intelligence. And what we found is our artificial intelligence is responsible for 51% of the attacks that we've identified, right? That's really important. And because the AI is really the driving force and the machine learning is really the driving force by identifying these highly targeted attacks. You know, and, and, and so it's, it's, you know, we got to keep that in mind because it's a new era. Things are in the cloud. Um, the game has changed. You move from on-prem, you moved into the cloud. You need a different type of solution. You need a different capability. You need a different way of solving that problem. And now AI is real. Right, so the, or, the the solutions you get to help solve this problem really need to be AI enabled from the ground up, and that's really our detection methodology. That's really where we're coming at it from, is we're using multi-tiered implementation of AI. It's going to evaluate hundreds of indicators about every single email that comes in. We're looking at various things like indicators of an attack. Is there, uh, you know, are they trying to obfuscate that that URL? That's one example, but. You know, is it coming from uh, an email, like I mentioned earlier, uh, with a low reputation score? Have we ever emailed this individual before? Um, you know, what about the language in the email? Does the language look fishy? Does it include words like invoice and authorize and password? Does it include a Bitcoin wallet address? <coughs> um, so we're looking at hundreds of indicators about every email and we're using our AI to accurately predict how, whether or not this email is phishing or not. And as the results are, we have a 99.2% accuracy rate, right? Incredibly high accuracy rate in, in the sense that we're gonna block 99.2% of the phishing attacks that are being, um, that are probably making it to your end users today. So from a prediction perspective, we always like to end the global fish report on uh, from a prediction. Um, uh, you know, talked about this continued focus on AI to solve the problem. If, if you're going to look at solutions to help secure email, you get, it's got to start with AI and AI and API, those pretty much go hand in hand. Um, phishing training, continued emphasis on phishing training. It's important. However, do not treat phishing training as your first line of defense. It is the exception handler. It is not a defensive mechanism. It's a way to handle exceptions, right? So first thing is you really need to implement AI-based technologies to solve that problem. Um, we're, you know, we're in a new era. Now we're, we're using different tools to collaborate. You've got OneDrive and SharePoint now add on to a Teams and, and Slack and all these other collaboration tools. It's not about securing email. It's about securing all forms of collaboration, right? Because now hackers will eventually find ways to get access to your team's account um, and use that to launch attacks. So really the whole point is to secure all um, forms of collaboration. There's gonna be continued focus by the hackers on the lowest hanging fruit. Um, we know that with absolute certainty, we've seen it uh, and that we, you know, that'll continue to be the thing. Um, the, the, the surface obviously will be much more prevalent. 
Um, the market is starting to shift towards API based solutions, right? So I mentioned at the, at the top of the, you know, the first bullet here is AI, but AI and APIs, APIs are essentially a, a new way. And I'll get into it in a minute, a new way to solve this problem, right? It's the next generation of email security solutions that is starting to get a much more mainstream now that larger enterprises are adopting this. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Avanon. Uh, I want to give you guys just a, you know, five minutes about who we are. I talked a lot about the problem and what we're seeing. Uh, if, if, you know, you don't mind me, I'd love to share a little bit about who we are and, you know, what makes us so good. Um, I, when talking about who we are, I, I leverage um, what our customers say about us. I like to let our customers do the talking for us. So, when you look, you know, on Gartner Peer Insights, if you go there, take a look, look at the cloud email, the, the email security solutions there, we're the number one ranked. Uh, we're at the top of the list, most reviews, highest um, score. Go to G2, um, you know, look at the cloud email security solutions, we're the highest satisfaction rank solution out there. Um, recently, uh, there's another uh, uh, acknowledgement we were given. A best in class email security solution. They looked at nine different vendors. They tested them all, put us through the gauntlet, uh, and selected us, Avanon, as the best in class solution. So these accolades continue to pour in. Um, we, you know, we've got you know all sorts of awards from you know SC Awards, Financial Times recently made us uh, named us the the tenth fastest growing company in the United States. Um, so we have all sorts of accolades uh, here that we're very proud of. Uh, but the ones that we're most proud of are the ones where our customers are essentially doing the talking. Why are they doing the talking? What, what do they love about us? And when we came to the market, you know, six years ago, we came to the market with a brand new approach. And we felt the, the, the legacy approach, putting an appliance, a gateway, sitting in front of 0365 didn't make any sense. We felt that that gateway approach made sense when email was on-prem, email moved to the cloud, things have changed. Things are a lot different. Taking the same legacy gateway, just stick it in front of 0365 doesn't make sense. So we came up with a brand new approach. And what that approach is, is it's leveraging APIs and AI to deliver the value that we're providing. Um, what does this mean for you as a customer, right? It means A, better security. We're gonna catch more attacks. We're gonna give you more capabilities Right, we're going to extend the entire suite. We're not just talking about email. Email is important. We secure email better than anyone. But what's the point of securing email? The point of securing email is to secure the entire suite. And that's exactly what we do. We secure email and we secure the entire suite. Teams, OneDrive, SharePoint. We're securing, we're providing full suite protection uh, from that perspective. So we're giving you better security one of the things that our customers rave about is the fact that we save them a tremendous amount of time. The capabilities we provide, we're easing the burden on them. Uh, we're easing the burden on the SOC. So that 23% I talked about earlier, how much SOC, we're drastically reducing that amount of time. And it's a simple five minute deployment. You don't have to believe anything I say because you can test it out for yourself. In literally five minutes, Customers can, can put us in their environment and put our claims to the test. And we always encourage that. Um, this is a research study, you know, more data to back up the fact that we are the best at, at stopping phishing attacks. We analyzed 360 million emails. We wanted to know who's, who's the best, right? How does Proofpoint compare with Mimecast and ATP? Here's what we came up with. We found that Avanon 15 times more effective than your legacy gateway approaches at stopping the phishing attack, right? Because we sit behind Proofpoint, we sit behind Mimecast. If you look at this, this architecture, when we're deployed in an environment where we're sitting behind these guys, we know what they miss, right? So we, we can tell you straight up, we know they're missing a certain percentage of attacks. Uh, ditto goes for ATP. A lot of people say, well, let's give ATP a try. The problem with ATP um, is, you know, that we know, we know it misses a lot of attacks prone to false positives and people are just kind of throwing their hands up with it. Um, you know, being like, this is as good as Microsoft's gonna get, Let's, we, need to, we need to look at alternatives. But again, I go back to the whole trial process. We always encourage, um, you know, our partners to encourage their customers 
to, you know, take our claims with a grain of salt and try it out for yourself. A simple trial, that's it. You know, plug us in and we'll show you everything. Um, we'll give you full access to the portal and show you all the attacks that the others would miss. Give you access to the capabilities to show you how secure OneDrive is and Teams is. We'll extend security to do DLP to make sure people aren't sharing sensitive information outside your organization. So we're giving you access to prove out the value uh, for yourself. Uh, a, a bit of a plug for our marketing team and, and, and the, the phenomenal job they've done. Uh, we've, we, we, we're proud of the content we, we, uh, we put out there. And um, we always say we got content to make you laugh, cry, and think. Right? You saw the comics earlier on. We, we think we're funny. Um, and when we come up with, you know, what we think is a funny idea, we put it into a comic and um, release it out there. So if you want to log into our comics, you can do that. Go to our website. There's a section there for comics. You can even subscribe to get alerts when we add new comics uh, up there. Um, content to make you cry. Uh, we've got our, what we call our attack briefs. Our attack briefs are uh, when we identify an attack uh, in the wild that was missed by another provider. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll dissect it, we'll deconstruct it, we'll understand how it was missed, why it was missed, um, and we'll write about it. It's more of a learning exercise so you can understand the different techniques that hackers are using. Again, same thing there, you can go to our attack briefs and um, subscribe to updates um, and then think. Um, we've got a lot of content up there that'll make you think, um, whether there are white papers, um, you know, we got webinars, things like that. So we want to, uh, we, we, you know, we want to give you content that's that's valuable in one of these three areas. If it'll do one of these three things, then I think we've uh, we've we've hit the mark. Um, if we got questions, we'll we can take some questions. Um, Richard, I don't know if you want to MC this, but uh, I appreciate your time, and um, you know, I look forward to working with you. Uh, please feel free to reach out um, if you got any questions. Okay, uh, thank you, Don. Um, okay, also, wer Fragen hat, bitte Fragen in den Chat. Uh, wir haben momentan uh, uh, drei Fragen, glaube ich. Uh, Don, the, the, the first question is, do, have you found out uh, the, the uh, origin of the area where the phishing attacks come from? Are they from China, from, uh, is this the a number which uh, you, you yeah. found out in the report? Yeah, it's, it's funny you asked that question. I actually took that slide out, um, mm -hmm. to be quite honest, um, because what we found is like 80% of the attacks are coming from the U.S. And that's, there's a really easy, re easy reason why, um, because what hackers are doing is, you know, they'll take over a domain in the United States or they'll VPN in to somewhere in the United States and send out their attacks that way. So at one point, that was a good method for discovering attacks. Uh, not so much any anymore. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, there's another question. Um, it, this is more a, a, a local thing. Is have you found out that they also in, in in the region in other languages are they also more advanced now? Or have you looked into different language options from the phishing attacks? Yeah, we haven't. That's actually a good good point. Um, we haven't done a, an analysis on um, the different machine learning. That, so that'd be the machine learning aspect of it. Of Maybe that's a good topic for a webinar um, or, 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 or a, a white paper, but we haven't done an analysis like what, you know, what words and which languages are more prevalent. So we'll, we'll take that as a note. Uh, I like that idea. Okay, yeah, because in, uh, in Germany, of course, or in Austria and Switzerland, uh, most of the people uh, speak German, you know, in Bavaria, probably not so proper. Where oh, I'm yeah. From. <laughs> yeah, now, but that's, uh, now, uh, along those lines, just to make sure I'm clear that we're, we're language agnostic in the sense that uh, it doesn't matter what language machine learning works um, just as well in one language versus another. Um, and, and so, but I think the question, I'm answering more of what the analysis looks like. So we'll mm -hmm. take a note on that. Okay, okay, great. Okay, the, the last question I answer. Uh, die, le die letzte Frage war noch, uh, wie kann ich das testen? Das ist relativ einfach. Einfach uh, uns kontaktieren. 
dann bekommt man einen 14-Tage-Key-Account. Dadurch, dass es ATP, API ist, da muss man, muss man nichts ändern. Man muss keinen nx record oder irgendetwas umstellen. Man hängt einfach das aber dann rein. Und dann kann man mal für, für 14 Tage im Read-Only-Modus schauen, was der, der Don vorher gesagt hat, was für was für Findings es gibt und dann kann der Kunde äh, selbst entscheiden, äh, ob das für ihn wichtig ist, ob das, äh, ob das ihm äh, äh, was bringt, ob das äh, ein Vorteil ist. Und bis jetzt unsere Erfahrung war, dass äh, keiner wirklich Nein sagen konnte. Also das ist bis jetzt äh, unsere Erfahrung. Deshalb äh, einfach mal testen, äh, kostet nichts. Äh, ist der Aufwand ist sehr, 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 sehr gering. Man braucht nur eine E-Mail-Adresse, damit man den den Account aufsetzt und dann, dann kann man es testen. Okay, falls es keine Fragen mehr gibt, dann äh, möchte ich mich noch recht herzlich für die Aufmerksamkeit bedanken und alle noch einen schönen Nachmittag wünschen. Okay, thanks Don for, for joining us, for sharing your, the information, your findings and uh, uh, I say also thank you to, to you and your team. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you guys, appreciate it. Okay. Thank day. you and good afternoon. Guten Nachmittag. Schönen Nachmittag. Tschüss.